hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Amen. Everyone, welcome again. My name is Lance. I'm so glad you're here at the gathering. We can always get more chairs if you're one of the folks that are in the back of the room. We'd be happy to help you out in any way that we can. As always, I'm so thankful that all of you are here with us today. And one of the things that we do in the gathering, whether you've been here for your first time or your 100th time, I just want to make sure that you know that uh, the way that we do kind of messages at the gathering is what we call series. And series are taking times to really focus on a topic for a number of weeks in a row, dig in on something a little bit more deeply, approach it from a bunch of different angles. And uh, if you ever want to catch up on a series, maybe that took place a long time ago, or one that's happening right now, you can always do so on YouTube. If you ever go to YouTube and just search the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, you'll find archives of all the worship services here and gatherings that go back uh, year after year. Um, you can also catch up on uh, whatever podcast app or device that you choose. So uh, you can always catch up and go back if you ever want to and pick up on anything that you've missed. And the series that we're in right now is a series uh, that focus, uh, focuses on a concept or a topic that is extremely central to understanding the story of God and the story of humanity and the story of faith, the story of the people of Israel uh, and the story of the followers of Jesus. It's the concept of worship, right? It's the concept of worship and specifically what it means to have God be at the very center of your life. Over and over again, the Hebrew Bible in particular, there's this, this issue of idolatry that keeps coming up, right? Idolatry, meaning placing something else other than God at the very center of your hearts and lives. And so those are the two things that we've been focusing on every single week. I'm going to keep introducing them uh, as well as this week and the last week, next week. Worship is more than just coming to church. Worship is more than just singing the songs. Uh, worship is more than just waiting for the invocation to come on the screen It not coming on the screen and then having to follow the leader back and forth because he forgot to put it in, right? Worship is... It's, it's as good as it's going to get. I'm trying, right? It's more, worship is more than just coming to church, right? Worship is whatever it is by which you, you say, this is the center of my life. This is the thing I believe in, right? This is the thing I trust in. This is the very foundation of who I am and who I think I am to be and what I think the world and life is all about, right? And it's more than just did you worship or not worship, right? The question is, what are you worshiping? What is it that you're putting at the center of your life? Because putting God in the center of your life is something that's done intentionally. It's something that's done on purpose. It's something that's done in corporate spaces and in the quiet of your own home, right? Worshiping God is an intentional act. And if you're not intentionally doing it, chances are you're unintentionally worshiping something else. And so that's specifically what we're talking about over and over again in the course of uh, this month, and that is idolatry. An idol, an idol is anything other than God that you place at the very center of your life. So over the course of this series, we're talking about the false gods. We're talking about the false gods that are active in Northeast Tarrant County in 2018, uh, the kind of gods, the kind of idols that are vying, whether we realize it or not, uh, for our worship, for our attention, right? What are the things that are actively seeking to pull us away from a relationship with God, right? Chances are you're not going to be invited to, uh, to worship Baal or Asherah or other ancient Near Eastern Canaanite deities that the people of Israel were being uh, you know, coerced into worshiping in the earliest pages of the Hebrew Bible. But what is it? What are the false gods, the idols that are vying for your attention and your faith in 2018? So two weeks ago, we talked about the false god of fame, right? The false God of fame, a God that is particularly powerful in the lives of our young people. In fact, tonight I'm going, uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be speaking at the youth worship this evening, right? And we're going to be specifically talking about that, this false God of fame, right? That is constantly speaking lies and false truths into our lives, trying to vie for our attention. And like I mentioned in that first week, every idol uh, exists on the back of two things, right? A lie, a fundamental lie, and a false promise, the lie that the false god of fame tells is that you're invisible. You're invisible, no one sees you, and no one cares, right? You're invisible, no one sees you, and no one cares. And when you see people acting out on social media, when you see people going crazy on YouTube, when you see people doing everything in their professional life, trying to build their brand, right, trying to raise their identity, they're living on through the lie that you're invisible and no one cares, right? And the false promise is that if you worship fame, if you do everything you can to advance your own name, then people will finally start to recognize you. You will finally actually matter, All right? We talked about the real truth in that, and it comes from the scripture that we read that talks about how over and over again we get these messages from God. Since you were knit together in your mother's womb, I knew you. I, I know every hair on the top of your head. I did this for you. I did this to dwell in you. I am here with you and alongside you. The constant message that we get from scripture is that God knows us and loves us, is here for us, and sees us. No matter what, you are never invisible. Right? Last week, the second week, we talked about what Martin Luther, the original Martin Luther, called the most common idol of all. 
the idol of wealth, right? The <laughs> idol of wealth. The idol of wealth lives on the lie that if you just had more money, right? If you just had more wealth, if you just had more value, if you just had more monetary, uh, if you just had more monetary means, if you just had more assets, then you would finally have the blank that you're looking for, right? If you would finally have the blank that you're looking for, if only you had more money, you would finally have more fun, you would finally have more joy, you would finally have more self-worth, you would finally have more stability in your life, you would finally have more freedom. If you only had more money, if you only had more money, you would finally have that thing that you're looking for. That's the lie that wealth tells over and over and over again. And the false promise that wealth tells every person in this room, every person in our workplace, every person in our school, every person in our community, the false promise that wealth peddles is that your best life, the best possible you will be there if you just had a little bit more cash, right? Just had a little bit bigger house. Just had a little bit fancier car. Just had a little bit longer vacation. Whatever it is, the false promise that wealth peddles and lives on is that you would finally have what you're looking for if you just had more money and the best life for you just depends on you having a little bit more, right? How easy it is to point out how untrue that lie is in other people's lives, right? And the truth is, the truth is, what we were talking about, the full richness and greatness of our possible life, like the fullness of who we are and who we are meant to be, always lasts not in our material possessions, always not in our bank account, always not in our bottom line, but in our relationship to God through Christ. We talked about that last week. We're moving pretty quickly. Uh, what I want to talk about this week is, a, uh, is another false god. It's a false god that is particularly good at grabbing the attention of the gentleman in the room. But no one's off the hook here. And that is the false god of power. The false god of power, right? The false god of power um, is uh, seductive and sneaky and lives through fear, right? False god of power uh, first functions on a lie. And the fundamental lie uh, that that power tells is that power equals control over others. That power is all about controlling other people. The lie that power tells is that true power, right, true strength, true ability, right, is all about getting other people to do what you desire. It's about controlling the fate of not only yourself, but of those around you, of controlling the destiny not only of your lives, but also of your your institution or of your school, of your neighborhood or in your community. And every one of us has seen someone who has fallen backwards into the worship of power, right? You don't even have to think about your television screen to imagine this, right? Just imagine whatever PTA meeting you've been to right? Just imagine whatever department you spent time in at different places in your career. Like, just imagine, God bless them, the homeowners association. (laughs) May you be healed, right? Power lives on the uh, lie that power is about controlling other people, right? And the false promise that power makes is not actually a promise at all. Right? Because that's not how power rolls. Right? Of course, if power is all about controlling other people, power doesn't make you a promise. The false god of power doesn't make you a promise. The false god makes a threat. Power, the false god of power, makes a threat to each and every one of us. And that threat that power makes to you is that everything is on the verge of of collapsing. That's the threat that power makes to you. No matter where you are, no matter how far you've come, no matter how you were elected, no matter what seat you have, no matter in what place you're serving, no matter how you're volunteering, no matter what title you have, right, the threat that power makes to people is that everything is on the verge of collapsing, and that's how power gets you to worship him. An act of worshiping power, 
all right? If coming to church, if singing to Christ, if receiving the communions, if praying, if serving, if giving, if all of these things are act of proclaiming that Christ is the center of our lives, that God is the source of our hope and our identity, if that is all an act of worship of God, then what does worshiping power look like? We fall into the worship of power each and every time we are conniving. We fall into the worship of power each and every time we leverage someone or use them to aid our efforts and then push them aside when they are no longer helpful, right? We fall into the worship of power every time we compromise some core principle of who we are to expedite some short-term goal, right? Those are all acts of worshiping power. Power loves every time the emails go around backbiting and undermining someone else. Power is like, mm, that tastes good, right? Power loves each and every time that someone furthers a lie or a half-truth or a caricature in order to try to undermine someone else. And power loves nothing more than when people uh, compromise the very identity of who they are because they have come to believe the lie that everything is on the verge of collapsing. Everything they've built, everything they've hoped for, everything they've written, everything that they've tried, every community that shaped, every school that they formed, every hedge that they managed to plant at the entrance of the subdivision. <coughs> HOAs, man. Right? We're all working through stuff. <laughs> We're all working through stuff. <laughs> right? Those are acts of worshiping power. Power loves it. I want to bring you uh, into a piece of scripture today. We're going to be in the second chapter, uh, I'm sorry, the second letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It's the book called Second Corinthians, if you're in your Bible. If you got one of the red ones from the back of the room, it's page 887. Uh, if you uh, have your Bible with you, just start in the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, you're going to get there pretty quickly. So I want to give you a little bit of a background to better understand this story, right? So a, a huge percentage of the New Testament is uh, the genre called epistles, which is the fancy word that means letters, right? They're letters back and forth between leaders and Christian communities, right? Addressing the issues that are going on. And there, we have two letters in the Bible that are from the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. Now, the Apostle Paul is someone who wasn't one of the original disciples and followers of Jesus. Uh, in fact, he was a Jewish man who was a persecutor of the early church, uh, the early Christians, but all of a sudden he he had this vision on the road to Damascus. He's, he's knocked off a horse. He's blinded, and he has an experience of the risen Christ, and he receives revelation from Jesus and from God's own self about who Jesus actually is and what he is to do to further and strengthen the kingdom in the world, right? So Paul has this amazing conversion story, and then he goes around and spends the rest of his life uh, teaching and preaching and founding churches and leading them and shaping them, right? And he's one of the strongest voices in all of the New Testament. Uh, the revelations that he received are a core of our understanding of who God is and who Jesus is and what it means to be faithful. So he wrote a huge percentage of the New Testament itself, and this is the letter to the church in Corinth. But one of the things that you need to realize is that he's not the only person who's out there doing this in the decades immediately following Jesus' resurrection and ascension, right? Also doing this are other apostles and other leaders, and, leaders, and also doing this are charlatans, right? also going into churches and also speaking and also vying for their loyalty and their faithfulness and their monetary support are charlatans, right? People who are not preaching an accurate gospel, right? This is, there's no boards of ordained ministry here. There's no authorizing agencies. There's no New Testament yet to even check all these claims against. So one of the things that he has to do is actually go back and defend his leading and his teaching to all these churches that he's already planted and started. And what's happening in 2 Corinthians is that the church that he founded and led, since he's left and gone on, other preachers and leaders have come in and started to undermine him, right? They've started to say, I mean, yeah, you're right about Jesus, you're right about faithfulness, but you've been listening to Paul? You've been listening to Paul? right? And they undermine him. They undermine the gospel that he teaches. They undermine his model of faithfulness and what it is to actually follow Christ in the world, right? And so in this letter in 2 Corinthians, what we see is an early Christian leader in the middle of a power struggle. He's literally in a fight for the very leadership, for the very soul of one of the earliest churches in the Christian community, 
right? And he's facing all these threats that people have said. And one of the things that they're doing is they're appealing to things that are incredibly common in the ancient Near East. They're saying, how can Paul be that great of a leader? He doesn't even speak very well. No one really likes his sermons, right? How can Paul be that great of a leader? Look at him. He's bald and schlubby, right? How... <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Stan. <laughs> <laughs> right? How can Paul be that great of a leader? Look at the mess that follows him everywhere that he goes, right? Surely, if he really was receiving God's favor, surely, if he really was gifted with this incredible gospel, everywhere that he went would smell like roses and everything that he touched would turn to gold. And they're un- gold. They're undermining the very ministry that he has and leads, right? Fortunately, nothing like that has ever happened in any Christian church ever since. We got that ironed out real early. He's facing a power struggle, right? And incredibly important for him to understand and for you to understand by what it is that he has authority, by what it is that he receives power, by what it is that he is to be meant to be followed uh, and, and uh, listened to comes in the text that we have today. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's in verses 6 through 10. And he's writing, If I did want to brag, he's saying, If I did want to brag, I wouldn't make a fool of myself because I'd tell the truth. I'm holding back from bragging so that no one will give me any more credit than what anyone sees or hears about me. I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I received, so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me, so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, this is, this is uh, Christ's message back to Paul, My grace is enough for you, because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weakness, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ, because when I'm weak, because when I'm weak, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. One of the key elements that they're using to undermine Paul is look how little power and control you seem to have over everything that happens, right? Just before in chapter 11, he goes through the litany of all the things he's experienced. I've experienced shipwrecks. I've been stoned. I've been whipped. I've been kicked out of towns. I've been threatened to an inch of my life. I've had to run and be lowered out of a basket over city walls, Right? And these are the very things that people are, looking, are, are using to undermine him, right? saying if he was really special, if he was really worth following, if he was really worth listening to, he would have much greater control over other people just like we do. That would be a sign of the strength and the power of God in him. And he says, what you need to understand about God is that it is exactly the opposite. What does he mean? What does he mean about when I'm weak, then I'm strong? Right? What is he saying? My wife is a uh, children's minister at another United Methodist church here in the area. It's in Saginaw, just a little bit north of here. And there is this key question that you get over and over and over again from kids. And it's basically this. <clears throat> if God came to earth in Jesus to fix everything and to set everything right, then why did God come as a nobody in nowhere with no political clout? They don't use that word because they're like eight. Um, (laughs) But no money and no army. Why does God do that? Why didn't God come to earth as a king or as a warrior Why didn't God just come down to earth as a superhero and zap everybody, right? These are like eight-year-olds. Why did God do that instead of what God did do, right? And if you can answer that, there is always a position available for you in (laughs) children's ministry, in this and every other community. Why? Why? If God came to change everything, why go about it this way? And that is because in Jesus, we see what God is actually like. 
In Jesus, we see where God's heart actually is. And in Jesus, we see where true power actually lies. And true power does not lie in the sword. And true power does not lie in economic might. And true power does not lie in winning this vote. True power lies in the self-sacrificial love of God. There is no way that God could redeem and restore and heal everybody through a general or through someone who wielded an army or political clout or economic malfeasance. There's no way, the only way for God to actually show who God actually is and what the world is actually about is to come in weakness with open hands and an open heart to teach and to tell and to receive because that is who God actually is, and that is where the true power lies. The true power that can only come not only generals, or not only armor, or not only kings, but the very grave itself. That is where real power lies. And Paul tells these people who have become obsessed with wealth and good looks and fancy preaching that real power real power, the real power to not only shape churches, but shape communities and shape businesses and shape political entities and shape communities and shape the entire world. Real power, real unassailable power, real unconquerable power can only come from living a life like Jesus. And that is what I am doing. And that's why his letter is in the Bible. And those rest of those dudes are gone because they talk a good game and they preach a good sermon. And as they say all these wonderful things about Jesus, but behind the heart of it is a desire to control and to manipulate and overpower others. No matter what they say at the end, they have fallen into the false worship of power. And following Jesus is never, ever, ever about controlling other people. So, where do we go in 2018? Where do we go in 2018 with this, right? Uh, Where we go is actually a poem, I think. I'm going to end with a poem, which is like a very old school preacher thing to do. Um, But it's a poem that was also in Breaking Bad, which is like a new school preacher thing to do. (laughs) 200 years ago this year, uh, a poem was written by Percy Bysshe Shelley. And it is a testimony to what worldly power looks like. It's a testament to where the God of power ultimately ends. It's a poem called Ozymandias. Uh, I I say it's one of my favorite things from high school literature. That's kind of a low bar to clear because it's like the only thing I remember. (laughs) But this, uh, this poem is a testament to where following the God of power ultimately ends. Would you play it, Allie? I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. You can worship the God of power, and you can achieve what seems to be great wealth and great influence and great control over other people. And no matter what, where that ends is in a crumbling statue in the middle of a desert that nobody sees or cares about.
or you can access real power. You can live a real powerful life. You can lead a real impactful life in following the source of all things God made known to us through Jesus the Christ, and where that ends is life eternal with the God who made you. May you worship that God now and every day of your life. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, we see in Jesus true power. Not power of the sword, not power of money, not power of political influence, God, the power of self-sacrificial love, the power of perseverance, the power of uniting with your kingdom, your purposes for this, your creation. And remind us, O oh God, that when we fall short, when we fall into worship of power, when we fall into acts of conniving, when we fall act into compromising who we actually are, when we lose track, oh God, we settle for something crumbling in the sand. Remind us instead that we are to follow you, to listen to you, to know you, and to live by your example in this world made perfect through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Guide us, keep us, shape us in his image as together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.